Good evening, everyone. Welcome into this week's edition of the Milford Informer. I am your host, Tim Coet. We hope everyone had a smooth transition back to the work week this week after April vacation and the holiday weekend. We have two extended news stories to bring you this week, both of which are tied to the Milford schools. Let's share the details as we get right into this week's top stories rundown. Tonight, we'll show you part two of our three-part panel discussion regarding the possible change of start times for the Milford schools. Also tonight, we sit down with Josh Otlin and Tony Chinapi to discuss a new mentorship program at Milford High School, and we'll share all of the details on how local residents can get involved. And later in sports, we'll take a look at the recently held Special Olympics School Day Games. Prior to Vacation Week, we began our three-part panel discussion regarding a potential shift in the start times of the Milford schools. Let's hear more from the panel as we bring you the second installment of that discussion. What we want to do from here is, is just introduce uh, a lot of the, the hot topics and questions that, that have been posed along the way as, as the committee has continued to move forward and research this topic. And so at this point, we really want to open it up to the full panel. Uh, I'll introduce a question, and, uh, and, and please feel free uh, to, for anyone who wants to, uh, uh, to, to participate in the discussion to please do so. And, and so the, the first question I want to bring out, and, and I'll start this uh, with you, Craig, is um, just for people who may be learning about this for the first time through, uh, through this discussion here today. Um, talk about whether uh, there might be some people out there wondering, is this already a done deal? Is, is the school prepared to move forward with this now? Uh, talk about that aspect of it and, and maybe the timeline moving forward for, for how you expect this okay. to, to potentially roll out. Okay. Um, no, it's not a done deal. Um, I think this, the work of the committee um, and the recommendation from our perspective is that, yeah, we're going to recommend a later start time for middle school and for the high school, um, but this still, you know, it, it has to be voted on by school committee. Um, we still have some conversations to engage in with um, the high school folks and, and the middle school people, but not to, not to forget the elementary folks either. Um, there are some contractual issues around changing start times too. Our, our teachers have designated start times right in their contract uh, and other staff members too, TAs and uh, librarians and so forth. So we'd have to probably open up the, the contracts of all of our employees and, and see if we can work that out with them. Um, we still have, as everyone has said, some barriers to talk about with athletics. Um, and I think beyond scheduling games, I think it's a conversation that we have to have with some of the districts in the Hockamock League, which coincidentally, there's a bunch of, of school districts in the Hockamock who are kind of in the same boat that we are. May not have made a decision, but um, I think that's, I think for us, if we're gonna start talking about changing, and other schools in the Hockamock are talking about changing. That's only good news for us. Uh, that could take care of that roadblock right there. Um, I, I, I believe that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, I can't remember if there's, there's really anything else that we have to discuss besides those, um, those kinds of things. And so you, you bring up a, a, a pretty interesting point with, uh, with other schools, uh, not only within the, the athletic division that Milford plays in, but uh, just sort of schools in the area. Um, and, and Len, I, I believe you were actually talking a little bit about this before, uh, before we started here today, that the Franklin schools had just recently held a discussion uh, talking about this as well. What, uh, what sort of uh, contact have you had with other schools that have maybe either already implemented a change or are considering a change and, and what's the feedback been like within other districts that have been uh, proposing these kind of changes? Well um, last year I was at a um, MAPT meeting it's a transportation uh, state uh, board that we belong to and Lexington did a presentation on you know change in their time which they've they have done successfully um, in other districts uh, there were two other districts that can't I don't remember exactly the third one and they all, you know, successfully made the changes. And they told us about the roadblocks that they were fighting. I brought that back to our committee. I think one of the biggest things is what we're doing right now is let the public know what's out there. 
so that we can get their feedback. You know, we did it through a questionnaire, we're doing it through a forum like this, and I know uh, we have some other things planned along the way. But um, as far as the roadblocks go, I, with um, one of the things being a hot topic sports, as Craig said, a lot of the hockey mock teams are looking at it as uh, many schools in Massachusetts are looking at. So it's not like an isolated thing. And it's, I, I predict in a few years, a lot of schools will be going this way. Right. Or, if, in, or if they're not in discussions, they will be in discussions with uh, changes. And I think, I also think it depends on um, which stakeholders you talk to at those different school districts. For example, in Ashland, um, Ashland just switched, I think they're in their second year, uh, they switched their high school to 820. Um, and if I, I speak to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, they say it's the best decision that's ever been made. However, I'm sure if you talk to some parents or teachers, they'll have a different perspective on it. Um, so there's going to be just varying degrees of, of either agreement, disagreement, it no matter who you talk to. Um, but I think the research is clear that it's the right thing to do. Do you get the sense that this is maybe the wave of the future, Milford's a, a little bit on the, on the front end of it, but is this something that as we go along is, is possibly going to become more common with, with districts across the state? Yeah. It, um, you know, we, I, I think, I, I say, like you said, we're on the front end of it, but there's certainly a lot of communities around us that are having these same discussions. Franklin's an example. They had a, um, a forum last night. I know Grafton's uh, involved with it, um, but there's, there's a number of other communities as well. Um, and I think if everybody gets on the same page and, and ends up shifting, then the things that we're talking about um, just become irrelevant because it's, it'll be the norm. As we continue to talk about the the sort of medical a aspect of this and, and the, the studies that have shown that, that these later times will, will help kids with sort of their, their natural body chemistry at this point in their lives, is when you take that into consideration, are there any concerns that with a, a later start time, you're, you're certainly giving students the, the extra sleep in the front end of the day, but maybe by shifting the, the end times of everything down and, and assignments at the end of the day, do things maybe end up evening out in the end where kids are going to sleep later, getting up later, and it ends up being maybe a little bit of a lateral move? Has there been, been any discussion about that? Two things that you have to remember is uh, one, one is that all the uh, adolescents, all the teenagers benefit from uh, a, a move like this. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, it, we, we have to uh, remember that part of it, and we have to re remember that uh, the, the, the times that uh, they are able to go to sleep uh, uh, is very, very important. And if, if they can't go to sleep at a certain time, then it's wasted time anyway. So it's important that you know, we, tr we try to adapt to their biology than it is to whatever our needs are. I know there's an awful lot of sacrifice that's gonna have to go on with this. But the important thing is we're benefiting all the teenagers. Uh, and, uh, and I think for, for that reason, uh, I really believe that uh, all schools are going to change. This is going to change. Uh, it may not be uh, today or tomorrow, but uh, uh, or even in my lifetime. But uh, it's all going to change, and, and, and the schools are going to start later. And the later, the better. Uh, for 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 the you you had mentioned, Doctor, about the de development of the, the the teenage brain. And if you just think of just that, and and the, the fact that changing the start time might help them not to use drugs, not to smoke, not to use alcohol, the how, how we can have an impact, even if it's on one child, uh, uh, on their developing brain. Isn't that a reason to do it, you know? And the research shows that when, sort of for all of us, not, not just for adolescents, but getting a good night's sleep makes you less likely to take risks, makes you, sort of benefits you in, in a whole host of ways, but one of the things is that you're less likely to take risks. Some of the um, research that we have looked at has addressed the, your question about are they, you know, they don't have to get up as early, so they, do they just stay up later? And what the studies have shown is that they may be staying up like 10, 15 minutes longer, but it's not, they're not staying up significantly later, um, so it really doesn't seem to 
to change their the time that they're able to fall asleep because like you said they're ready to fall asleep the melatonin has kicked in and they're settling down um, and that they're actually getting more hours of sleep with the delayed start they're not staying up later Jim, you, are, you have a, a current Milford High School student yourself who is heavily <laughs> involved in, in athletics and, and, and activities throughout the school. Uh, just sort of thinking about, uh, I know he's obviously ready to head off to college next year, but just, just sort of looking at what his schedule is typically like now, if these changes were to be implemented, do you feel like that's something that would benefit a student who is as involved in, in those activities later on in the school day as, as someone like Josh is? Actually, I do, yeah. I mean, when I, I was actually just thinking about that when we were talking about it, you know, looking at the difference between, you know, Josh's sleep patterns and even Jake's, who's going to be a freshman next year. Um, they're both significantly different. Um, my youngest actually tends to go right to bed at 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's just habitual for him or not. Um, Josh has always been the antithesis of that, so he is up. He is the quintessential, um, you know, teenager he's up till 11 he's up till 11 15 11 30 um those seem to be his peak hours and um when he goes to <laughs> when he goes to bed um i'm not quite sure to craig's point that he's not still somewhat active so i'm not quite sure when he's falling asleep and he does fall into a typical pattern where he does sleep longer in the morning and to everyone's point that has an adolescent it's very difficult to get them up and motivated um, and then comparing him to to my youngest from a personal perspective um, you know Jacob is up and, and out of the house much earlier much more effectively than Josh um, no offense Josh but um, <laughs> uh, but that's that's typically the, you know how how we see it how we see it going and um, I feel like he's a lot more of the norm than not this year MHS has been piloting a new mentorship program called connections the program is looking to expand in the years to come and is looking for more participation from the community. To find out more details about the program, I sat down earlier this week with two of the driving forces behind Connections. And we are very happy to be joined on the Milford Informer this week by two representatives from an exciting new program coming to the Milford schools. It's already in its pilot program this year. It is the Connections program. So we, of course, have Milford High School Principal Josh Otland joining us. We also have Tony Chinapi, who of course, really needs no introduction in the Milford community. Very well known here in town. Uh, but first of all, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so again, Milford Connections program, it's, it's an exciting new mentorship program that, that's taking place at Milford High School. You're in the, the, the pilot year uh, of it this year. But um, uh, starting with, with you, Josh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe the, the basics of this program and you know, what maybe the, the, the initial appeal was in bringing a program like this to the Milford schools? Sure. Yeah. So I, the, I think the, the program came about when I was approached by Tony and, and other folks from the Milford Foundation for Education, which is a relatively new community-based nonprofit organization that was trying to find ways to, um, you know, really make a positive difference with regards to our students. And um, when I first met Tony last year, Tony was interested in trying to work on some kind of mentoring program. And I thought that that would be kind of well aligned to our needs in the school. We have, um, we have a lot of young people with a lot of promise who are facing some pretty significant obstacles. Um, in their way, and we know that um, having a student work with a mentor is not necessarily going to clear all those obstacles out, but it can make a tremendous difference. Um, you know, I think all of us in education and in families know how much of a positive difference you know, an adult can make in the life of a, of a young person, um, particularly as they're you know, trying to navigate some pretty tricky waters. Um, so when I heard from Tony that he had a group of folks in the community, accomplished professionals who were willing to give up their, give up their time to serve in a mentoring capacity, uh, I thought that could add a lot of value um, to what we're doing at Milford High School and could really make a positive difference um, for a number, a number of our students. Tony, you've been heavily involved in, in this program since its inception. Uh, what sort of uh, has your experience been like so far uh, working with this program and, and getting people from the community together to, to take part in this? It's been an excellent opportunity for, for me to get kind of back into the school as a former teacher. And it's also been an opportunity for some people from the community to come in the schools. A lot of things are said about the school, good and bad, et cetera. But when you come in there and you meet the kids, you see the diversity, you feel the diversity, you see the th good things that are going on, the dedicated teachers, the guidance people, uh, even the, the staff, the cafeteria ladies. I used to have a special connections <laughs> with, with those ladies. Um, and, and again, as Josh said, kind of the coming together. Now, we can't serve all the needs of, of the school community, but uh, we've selected some kids uh, with academic pro uh, promise, and we've developed a pilot program. We've learned a lot from it. Uh, we really have, uh, as I was saying before we started, 
we try to solve a lot of problems, then you realize that if you can just start out uh, and, and do some small things, make some small accomplishments, uh, feel good about it, and then build on that success, and that's where we are. Basically, the reason why we're here is to recruit new mentors. We also call them connectors, i.e. The, the program connections. Uh, because it's an opportunity for people to come into the schools, it's their school, uh, their high school, and, um, and kind of rub elbows with the kids, with the faculty, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and I think we've had successes, and, and again, we, we've learned a lot so we can improve it for, for this year. And as we get into the, the details of the program, it is a commitment, but it's not a forever commitment. And we've adjusted uh, so that different people have different roles. For example, we visited colleges. So there's one young lady uh, who has some time restrictions, so she's the coordinator for those kind of events. Uh, we've got some, matter of fact, I just met with a gentleman yesterday who's interested, but he's not interested necessarily in the one-on-one -on -one relationship, but he'd like to come in and talk about career issues. And he could be a great resource. He's, a, 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 he's just retired from a, a very successful business in town. So uh, we're, we're looking for people that right now that just have a willingness to come in Check us out at the informational sessions. We'll try to describe what it's like. We're going to have some um, workshops during the course of the summer to get people up to speed on things to do and how to kind of break the ice uh, with the, uh, the young students. And then again, uh, for example, in my case, um, I've started with, with two young men, and I'm going to go with them next year as they become sophomores. And then we're going to move to juniors and seniors. And then as Josh will allude to, we're also concerned about college completion because a lot of kids get there and they don't finish and there are all kinds of issues that stem from that. So uh, we want to just lay out the program. It's very informal uh, and the feedback that I've gotten from the people that have been involved, it's just a good opportunity to, 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 to talk with, share things. Uh, we don't realize sometimes as adults what we know. You know sometimes we, we don't know what we don't know. Right. And, and as a result, uh, the kids are very, very willing to uh, accept that because they see the commitment that we've made. So just touching a little more, Josh, on, on this, the students involved in this program, this is obviously, you know, these are students that, that through various circumstances are just, uh, you're looking to reach these students and, and give them these opportunities that, that for one reason or another, they, that might just not be available to them, to, to give them that opportunity to, mm -hmm. to succeed post high school. Yeah, so the, you know the students that, that we've that we've targeted thus far is you know we've identified students who have um, v attained very high levels of academic achievement, but are otherwise facing what we know to be significant obstacles to success after high school. So, um, you know, uh, the students who are participating right now are coming from households that are facing you know really significant financial hardship. Um, a number of our students are coming from families where their parents are recent immigrants to the United States of America, um, and we know that you know. Just being a really good student is, um, it's not enough to achieve success after high school. Um, you need to be a really good student. You need to work really hard. Um, but you also need to have a lot of kind of insider knowledge um, that a lot of families don't have if they're recent arrivals to the country or that, um, you know, some insider knowledge that families may not have if it's a single parent who's, you know, working hard and maybe didn't go to college themselves or, um, you know, doesn't have other children who've, who've attended college. And so... By connecting these students with, you know, accomplished professionals in the community, um, who, you know, probably know a lot of things that they take for granted um, about how to position a young person for success, um, we're hoping that that really can, you know, help students to, you know, overcome some of the obstacles that are normally in their way. Um, we know, um, you know, I, th I think a, a figure that I that I, that I like to share with people that I think is really kind of takes some folks by surprise, is if you look at um, the very highest achieving students in this country who come from economically disadvantaged families and who go to college, we're the best students, best students in this country are economically disadvantaged. And you look at the rate at which they complete college, they complete college at a rate of about 42%, right? These are ACE students, you know, kids who are, you know, have tremendous academic skills, but that's not enough, right? Um, there's a lot more than just being a good student to get them through. Um, you know, I, I don't. I, you know, I don't think that a mentoring program is a silver bullet. I don't think just because we hook students up with a mentor, that in 100% of the cases it's going to make that decisive difference for students. Um, but I do believe that there's you know great potential in connecting our students to accomplished professionals who really do have that kind of insider knowledge. And I think that in many cases, 
um, it is going to be a game changer for the kids. Yeah, it's, a, it's an outstanding resource to be sure and, and, mm -hmm. and one that uh, I know you guys are really looking to, to grow in, in the years to come as this program continues to build. And uh, again, that's uh, you're looking to get the word out now to, to try to bring additional mentors into the fold. And so mm -hmm. you have some opportunities, as you mentioned just a moment ago, Tony, to, to uh, have some informational sessions to, for people for the community to come in uh, and, and talk about that. So we, we want to get that information out there right now. There's going to be two days of informational sessions. One, The first one is coming up on Thursday, May 2nd. So that's next Thursday, uh, May 2nd, with two sessions that day. At at 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock, and then there will be another day Wednesday, May 8th, where once again uh, at 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock folks can come in. That's all taking place uh, at the MHS Media Center. Uh, what's some of the information that you're hoping to get out there that day, Tony? <clears throat> well, basically, we prepared a, an outline uh, looking back at the program, looking forward to the program. We want to recruit people because the way we've set it up with the, with the young people that Josh has mentioned is that we have four mentors now. We think that's a, a reasonable number. We have literally eight students, or we plan to have eight students. So we can get the students no problem. We've got a, pl a plentiful supply. But now in the mentors, if I move up as a sophomore now, I'm finally making it to my sophomore year, and, and my, my two boys come with me, uh, now, uh, so we get new people coming in as freshmen, then eventually I'm going to move up to be a junior, and we're going to need more people for more mentors at least, uh, and, and again, we will have eight other students and we keep on going. And as you would expect, I think one would expect, that as we go further, sophomore, junior, senior, each year has its own hurdles that are set up for us, where college boards come into play, where PSATs and other achievement tests and visitations to college and selecting colleges, getting a good idea on one's career. Um, I haven't realized what I really want to do yet. You know, it's, and here we are trying to set these kids up at, at 16, 17, 18, but it's, it's good exploration. One of the things that I want to clarify, particularly for folks that, you know, are interested in coming in and, and you know, considering helping us out as a mentor is, you know, Tony's talked a lot about um, preparing kids for life after high school. And I want to be clear that, like, you know, we've got guidance counselors at school and, you know, we're not looking for our mentors to replace the, the excellent work that our guidance counselors do. But where we believe that the mentors can play a, a really critical difference for kids is in the same way that um, they can really be sort of like one other adult figure in the student's life. So just in the same way that for many families, um, the whole process of post-secondary planning, the counselors doing their specialized role, but the parents also talking to their students from an early age, helping to you know, create a set of expectations and aspirations for the students, helping to expose them to all the different opportunities that are out there, um, helping to broaden their horizons. That's where we see sort of mentors playing a, a really critical role um, for students, particularly who may not have someone in their family that's well positioned to play that role for them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's hard work, but we're not looking for anyone to go back to school. We're not looking for anyone to get a grad degree so they can come be a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. We have great folks at school that are very well equipped to help students with the academic planning and the post-secondary planning. But we know that the more adults that are engaging students and thinking seriously about their future and thinking about how to position themselves for success, the more likely it is that students are going to be successful at that. It's, it's a tremendous support system to put in place mm -hmm. uh, for these students to assist them along the way for whatever their, their post high school careers could be. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an outstanding program. Uh, we certainly are, are, are looking for, uh, for all the best for you guys to see this continue to grow. So again, we want to get that information out there. Uh, the two informational sessions for anybody out there who might be interested in becoming a mentor uh, to be part of this program, it's May 2nd and May 8th that those sessions will be taking place, uh, one at 3 o'clock and one at 7 o'clock on both of those days, and all of that is taking place uh, at the MHS Media Center. Uh, and Tony, also for, for other folks out there who, again, may be interested and may be looking for a little more information, they can contact right. you yep. as well. Uh, so we'll put Tony's information up on the screen right now uh, so you can contact Tony via phone or via email uh, to get some additional information there if, uh, if you are interested. Again, we cannot thank you guys enough for joining us. Josh Otland, Tony Chinapi, thank you guys very much for being here. Thank you thank for having us. Recently, the Milford Area Special Olympics enjoyed their annual School Day Games. The School Day Games provide a great opportunity for kids of all ages to get outside and enjoy an afternoon of fun and athletic events. Milford TV producer Mike Sperling traveled out to the event, so here is a recap of the 2019 Special Olympics School Day Games. Oh, 
let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. I promise to give of the time in my life so that Special Olympics athletes can have the time of their lives. I promise to support Special Olympics, not just as an expression of charity, but as a form of respect for my fellow human beings. I promise to spread the word of volunteerism because in giving, I receive so much more in return. I pledge to honor the Special Olympic spirit, rewarding performance and effective results. I will coach all athletes in training and competition, sharing knowledge and fostering teamwork, respect, integrity, pride, and joy. My name is Jennifer Walsh and I'm the local program coordinator for the Special Olympics here in Milford. I'm also the um, transition vocation coordinator for Milford Public Schools and today we're here for our annual school day games. The School Day Games, it's a Special Olympic event to expose all our students with intellectual disabilities to a day of Special Olympics. So we have all age, ages from pre-K through 8, and then our high school students are volunteers at the Games. Our high school students don't know what they're in for until they come the day of to participate, and they always want to come back year after year because they enjoy it so much. This day is very special because to see all the joy in everybody's heart and to see them um, participate in something where they have so much success and that brings joy to their heart, it's just a great day all around. We have unified sports at the high school. We also have community Special Olympics. So we have Special Olympics offered from um, all ages now um, here, including the school day games from ages three and up. So you can participate in Special Olympics for the rest of your life. But we don't have a lot of programs for the younger kids, so we're trying to make more programs for the younger kids, and today is all about that. For the first time this year, um, our Milford High School principal, Josh Otland, had the whole high school come out and cheer on all our athletes. We also have more activities, and, and a larger number of um, kids with and without disabilities participating today. Let the game begin! Let the games begin! Before we leave you tonight, here's a heads up that we will have Thursday's softball game between Milford and Taunton, available for viewing on the Educational Channel and on YouTube by early next week. We'll also have more coverage of MHS baseball coming up on Monday as the team hosts Davenport rival Stoughton. As always, we thank you for tuning in from all of us here at Milford TV. This is Tim Coet saying have a great week. So long, everybody.